Because that, oh. that, that would have been painful. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah. Well, it looks like you're going to have a good turnout. Well, there's a big line out there. Feed them and they will come. Yeah, yeah. You know this. All right. All right, well, she'll be down in a minute. She can break through the crowd. She's here, huh? Yeah. She's outside oh, on her phone. How's classes going this first year, first semester? Yeah. What are you enjoying the most? Or, oh. or you're not enjoying it? <laughs> Which means you're normal. Then. <laughs> no, I'm liking it all. I've been prepping on the prim on that. You like prim? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh oh. You might want to be a criminal lawyer, huh? I don't know. Like That's interesting stuff, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Because it's so human, right? Yeah. Who, who, who do you have for it? Yeah, he's the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the colorful guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, he'll wake you up. No problem. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's going good. I got um, I got 84 students. That's the biggest I've ever had, yeah. Right, yeah. So, but they're a good group. Make sure you get to know the LLM. I told you that. Yeah. Yeah. And where where are you living now? You live like like on not nearby, right? Yeah. Okay. Nice. That's cool. Do you have a roommate too? Oh, right there. Okay. Nice. Okay. Test one two. Testing one two. Enjoy. Testing wireless mic C. Test one two. Test one two. Testing one two. Testing wireless mic C. Test one two. Test one two. Test one two, testing one two, test one two, test one two. Test one two, test one two, testing one two, test one two, test one two. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Miles and Elena Zaremski Law Medicine Forum. These uh, lunchtime talks are uh, endowed by uh, an alum, Miles Zaremski, a 1975 graduate of the law school, uh, okay, and his uh, uh, partner, uh, Elena Zaremski, and we're very hap uh, fortunate that they have done this because we are able to bring uh, remarkable speakers uh, uh, such as uh, Anthea Daniels, who is here with us today, uh, Vice President and General Counsel of Akron Children's Hospital Health System. Uh, she graduated from this law school in 1989. Uh, she then uh, practiced law uh, uh, at Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, uh, where she co-chaired the health law department for many years. Uh, and uh, then she joined Baker, Donaldson, Bierman, Caldwell, and Berkowitz, uh, and was a member of their health law department, and then recently transitioned to be uh, the vice president and general counsel at Akron Children's. Uh, her talk today uh, is entitled The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Practicing in the World of Health Law, From Firm to Remote to In-House. And without more, please welcome Anthea Daniels.
uh, her talk um, today I guess, uh, is entitled The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Practicing in the World of Health Law from Firm to Remote to In-House, and without more, please welcome to I was here on a panel about two weeks ago, which is sort of unusual, the timing of this. How many people were here then? Oh, God, I feel so sorry for you, but it's a free lunch, right? And I hope there's lots of cookies or caffeine or something like that. So I was here on a panel. Oh, okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. So um, to tell you the truth, what I'd like to do is, um, but it's a free lunch, right? And when Professor Melman asked me if I'd be interested in your speaking up, I could have come and spoken to you about fraud and abuse, or stark, or false claims, and FBI, and we could have talked about uh, parental consent in children's hospitals, uh, especially in light of so many different family situations, and who do you get consent from, and it's sort of over-changing and morphing, and the, you know, about consent being so easy. Uh, especially in light of, um, but I sort of thought I would talk more about the soft topics and, um, and talking about my experience. Um, but I guess I want to stop along the way and say so it's easy to stop and ask questions. Um, I think this will be more interesting. But I sort of thought I would talk more about the soft topics amongst all of us in this meeting. Talk about my stuff that maybe you will find totally boring. Um, if you want, uh, you could write questions on a piece of paper. Um, this will be more interesting. I sort of thought I would talk more about the soft topics amongst all of us in this meeting. Talk about my stuff that maybe you will find totally boring. Um, if you want, uh, you could write questions on a piece of paper. Um, this will be more interesting. I sort of thought I would talk more about the soft topics. Oh, I stopped. Talk more about my stuff that maybe you will find totally boring. Um, are you is someone? Oh, okay. yeah. All right, let's see. All right, so um, you know it's sort of interesting. I graduated uh, from from law school here, and uh, I did a bunch of interviews on site. Uh, they were done my first year. I did it all myself. Then the second year, I did stuff through the the career center, and um, I uh, I landed a few different summer jobs here and there, and then I ended up going to Kelsey where I did health law. Um, so uh, in the other presentation when I was here, I sort of talked about the fact that uh, I did I thought I wanted to be a litigator, and then I took Professor Melman's course third year, and I found it fascinating, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. It's got a lot of people aspects to it, um, betterment trying to take care of people and their health, and I thought. This is interesting. Sort of merges health, medicine, policy with uh, with the law, and so I found it interesting. So I went to a firm, and um, I can tell you there's lots of different careers, and I have friends that did different things. But they went and they did um, judicial clerkships, and then they ended up going um, into different law firms and solo practitioners, etc. But I'll sort of tell you a little bit about my path because I sort of feel like um, up until four years ago. I had no interesting story to tell. I had been at Kelsey for 26 years. So I had done sort of like a lifetime at one firm. And um, I will say that uh, I went to my uh, 30th high school year reunion, uh, which was local. And um, I heard the words coming out of my mouth. They were like, oh, where'd you go to undergrad? And I was like, oh, I went to Denison. They were like, oh, where'd you go to law school? Oh, I went to Case. Oh, where do you work? Oh, I work at Calpe. Oh, that's a firm in Cleveland. Oh, so you've never left Ohio. And I was like, who is that boring person? And, you know, it's interesting because when I first started working, everyone, primarily at my firm, but I think if you looked at Squire or Jones Day or Baker Hostetler or any Omer and Byrne, any of the larger firms, People were lifers. People stayed, they, they joined the firm, and they stayed there until the day they retired. And basically around 10 years ago was this concept of people were going to have seven careers. I remember thinking, oh, I'm not going to have seven careers, you know, I'm probably going to have just this one, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I sort of just woke up one day and said, um, I've got to shake this up. I've got to take control of my career. I've got to sort of, if I want something different, I'm going to have to do something different. And so I joined the law firm of Baker Donaldson, which is about 800 lawyers. Um, and I worked remotely. So we'll talk about that, and I put it all by myself. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be in a firm, and then we'll talk about what it means to be in house. So the firm life, you know, um, you know, what is it being in a firm? Uh, being in a firm at the beginning is being a good associate, right? So it's being very proactive, it's uh, exceeding, at meeting or exceeding expectations of the partners or the associates that give you work. Um, it's meeting the deadlines, it's being inquisitive, it's being proactive, it's all of that. Um, and then there's the issue of the rainmaker. So, you know, law unfortunately in the last 20 years has become very competitive. Um, and with the internet, there's a lot of people that aren't lawyers that think they can be lawyers and they download documents, et cetera, um, and they do a lot of stuff. And then we have a lot of consultants in the healthcare world. There's lots of consultants. The accounting firms are doing stark and fraud and abuse. The consultants are doing stark and fraud and abuse. I mean, we only have, we're the only ones that have the privilege of the conversation, the communications. And so that's sort of the, you know, the sort of cachet of, of still being a lawyer, but everyone else is out there sort of doing and selling the same kinds of services we do. So, but for litigation, the rest of the world is competing with us, and like I said, the internet is full of, of information. And it's funny because we, whenever I work with, with associates, and right now Lauren is doing an internship at our hospital, um, whenever um, I talk with them, in the last 10 years I'll say, Google it. Because if you Google something and you know how to phrase the question, you can sort of get like into the ballpark of the issue. You might not, you know, you might not get specifically into your chair in the ballpark, but you're in the ballpark, and you can sort of read and sort of figure out a little bit of the sort of bigger picture of everything. So, um, uh, client development is extremely huge in law firms. Um, when I joined, uh, they were like, "Oh, client development is for the partners. They do that later. Don't worry about that. Worry about your expertise." And I still believe that's true, is that you do want to worry about your expertise. However, I think at the same time, you also have to um, think about client development. And what does that mean? And actually, for all of these jobs, for any job that you're going to do, the most important thing probably is creating relationships and having a network. Because that network may help you find a job, uh, find an answer to a hard problem that you have, introduce you to someone that's going to assist you in some way, you're going to assist them in some way, and it's that relationships and that network that you have. Um, I think that you're starting that network now, right? And I remember that's why I sort of picked Case, because I thought, well, I think I'm going to stay in Cleveland. And a lawyer had said to me uh, two things go to the best law school you can get into. And he said, and then the second one is, go to the law school in the city where you think you're going to practice. He goes, because eventually, he goes, you'll know all the partners, you'll know the judges, you'll know this, that, and the other. And that's partially true. So, um, so anyway, um, client development and creating your network is key in the law firm world. Uh, gone is the day of the expert lawyer that didn't have to have much social skills, and they could sort of sit in a room and spew out tax information or ERISA. Um, when I first started, we, we had quite a few of those kinds of people that were sort of uh, introverts, et cetera. Um, but in the world where uh, you know, it's billing for a living and you know, covering your expenses, et cetera, when you become a partner, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really work anymore. So what I would say to all of you is if you're going to go into a law firm setting is think about your network and think about the idea that you're going to sustain yourself one day. You're going to be able to find your own work um, and or primarily you know 50% of your own work or 75% of your own work, etc. Um, the other thing is technical expertise. You know, um, plan your course, plan your own destiny. Take a proactive, um, take a proactive stance in your own job. Um, you know, there's two different kinds of health lawyers. Um, there's health lawyers that do everything. I was sort of a generalist when I was at Calfee because we had a very small staff. 
but at Baker Donaldson or at McDermott, Will and Emery or Alston and Bird or uh, they got to continue with the names. Um, they have specialists. So someone just does fraud abuse. Someone just does maybe Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. Um, we had a woman, she did all of the EMTALA situations. So she was the EMTALA expert. I mean, that's just one specific regulation in the federal law. That's the Emergency Medical and Treatment and Active Labor Act that talks about anti-dumping in emergency rooms. So people are very specialized. So once you get into these big, big firms, you become super specialized in something. Um, and so you have to think about, like, do I want to do one thing or do I want to be able to do other things? And so when you're out there interviewing and looking for jobs, those are things to ask about. You know, how, how big is your department? At Calfi, we, you know, it was sort of funny because I always, I always try to make the department bigger than it was from my sales position. I always wanted to go, well, this person does real estate for hospitals and nursing homes, so they're partially, right? They provide services to the healthcare industry. They understand maybe about fraud and abuse from a real estate <laughs> contracting standpoint, so I will put them in the, you know, the healthcare department. Uh, but in, in actuality, we had probably three or four people that did it. But then we had bond lawyers, like I said, we had the real estate, we had the litigators that did this, that, and the other. And so I could cobble together, you know, a group of, you know, maybe 30 people that knew some of the acronyms in health law and they knew some of the things and they could intersect and work with us in the health law department to make sure they weren't violating any of the regulatory laws when they were doing their real estate contracts or whatever, or their corporate contracts. So, um, those are things to think about. You know, at Baker Donaldson, we had 100 healthcare lawyers, and it was truly 100 healthcare lawyers. So we had people that specialized in everything, and so you just sort of have to figure out like, what do you want? What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? Um, uh, we'll talk. I think we talked about all that. So, so after that, after doing the firm life for 26 years and uh, dealing in the firm, I decided I would, I would go to Baker Donaldson. Um, their closest office at that time was Washington, D.C., but my office was out of Nashville. So my secretary was sat in Nashville and they sort of came up here and they set me up in my basement of my house with everything. Um, and my phone rang and it was, you know, people only had to dial the five digits and it, it, so people thought I was sort of in the system and that I was in one of the offices and because they had 20 offices, it worked from the standpoint of, you know, the office in Alabama is calling Atlanta or they're calling uh, uh, Memphis or whatever and so it didn't really necessarily matter where I was. So, um, but if you are going to work remotely, uh, it, it's a little bit like being a solo practitioner in some ways. You have to be pretty IT technically savvy. I always thought that the day that would be my worst day would be when my scanner died because I don't type documents because when I started, um, we didn't have computers on our desks. So we had dictaphones and we had secretaries. And so I just marked up documents and I still do that to this day. You know, I mean, I remember my husband helping me with something at Calfee when I was there for about 20 years, and he looked uh, at it and he said, "How is it you only have six documents?" He goes, "You should have thousands of documents." I was like, oh, "I don't, I don't do it. They're brought in my secretary." So, um, being technically savvy obviously is very important. You guys are all technically savvy, so you don't have to worry about it. But um, there is the then the the loneliness factor too. I think this happens with solo practitioners. And work when you work remotely, um, you know. So I remember the managing partner of Baker Donaldson at the time when he met me. He said, "He goes, I wondered who who this woman was that was leaving her firm to work remotely in the basement of her home." And so he sort of looked quizzically at me, like, "Why would you want to do that?" Um, but the reason was I wanted to be part of a really huge health law practice. I wanted to see what it was like to not have to do everything and not have to go, oh, I can do that. I don't know if I can do that, but I can do that, and let's start Googling. And so to be part of a big group where you could collaborate, and you know, there were 15 people that did fraud and abuse, and so if you wanted to, you could bounce all these issues off of them, and you had this great collegial group. So, um, but there were other challenges with it. You know, you had to sort of market yourself within the, your firm, because any, every time I went to Nashville and I would go there, maybe about once a month and I'd sit there for two or three days, 
I think people were like, who, who are you? What, oh, what do you do? Oh, so while pe some people knew me in the health law group, um, it was still a big health law group and everyone in the health law group didn't necessarily know me and I didn't necessarily know all of them. And so um, uh, it, 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 was, it was challenging. Um, I think that this was going to be more the wave of the future. I think that you know the accounting firms as of five years ago are handing out offices, I'm told. They just sort of have these communal areas um, where people can come in or they say to them, um, just do your work. Uh, we don't have vacation. Just take whatever vacation you know you sort of want. And we, you could work at Starbucks. You could work here in our communal area. You could work from home. We don't really care. So I think it's the same issues that you have of you know how do you integrate? How do you you know uh, get mentored? You know how do you learn from other people? You know so these are these are things to think about. The FaceTime. I did a lot of work over the phone and via email. Um, so then I got a call uh, to leave the basement and to go in house. And um, you know in in Northeast Ohio there aren't a lot of in house jobs to be the GC. Um, so when I first started working, there were about 35 independent hospitals in Northeast Ohio. Um, you know, there were various systems, the Humility of Mary Healthcare System out of Youngstown, and there were hospitals in Elyria and a few in Akron, and Cleveland, you know, was made up of the Meridia Health System, which was four independent hospitals that merged around the time I was getting out of law school. And, uh, Fairview and Lakewood were independent, and Lutheran was independent, and there was a hospital called Mount Sinai that's no longer here. So there were tons of different hospitals, and so there were tons of GC physicians, and there was also tons of law firms that supported all those different hospitals because they didn't want to all hire the same law firm. So there was lots of health law to go around, and then the um, collaborations and the mergers started occurring in the mid-90s, and we ended up where we are, which is pretty much what has happened around the country, um, although our consolidation happened very quickly in the 90s, and I think we're even a more consolidated market than other markets. So um, what that did is it basically sort of dried up the GC kinds of positions. So when this position came, I thought about it long and hard, um, and working for a children's hospital is you know, sort of a special thing. Um, it's very sad some days. Um, and uh, for being a lawyer and hearing lawyer jokes for the last 30 years, it's sort of nice to at least, you know, sort of be linked with an organization that has um, an extremely um, <coughs> good charitable mission. So, um, but the hospital is, is basically um, a $1 billion uh, revenue generating hospital. We had over a million treatment um, interactions last year. Uh, we have two hospitals, one in Beagley um, in Youngstown and one in Akron. We have about 39, I think it says, or 29 locations where we have pediatric offices um, all over from Mansfield to, like I said, Youngstown, crossing over the Erie border and um, to the west and down to, to um, Canton, all over the place. So lots of, lots of service. Um, so, What's the difference, right? Um, suddenly, I'm managing a, a legal department. Um, and managing a legal department is quite different than managing associates in your department because most associates want to make partner. And so if you say jump, they go, no, OK, I'll jump. Um, in a legal department and in a corporate setting, uh, you sort of want someone to do something, and they can sort of pick and choose if they'd like to. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a different uh, situation. Law is very, uh, so, so I will say as an aside, I hope I didn't mention this last time, um, The Devil Wears Prada. How many people have seen that movie? Okay, uh, this gentleman has not. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that movie? Have you seen that movie? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> so, so I watched that movie and I miffed by the fact that they're all so annoyed with what she has to do for her job. Um, because, uh, except, for the, except for having to get the manuscript for the Harry Potter book that wasn't out, I thought everything else, like running and fetching this or the thing being thrown on her desk, I was like, yeah, that was sort of like what it was like to be a young associate. And see, Professor Melman's nodding his head too, because he did the young associate stint in Washington, D.C. 
And so it, it isn't really that crazy that like someone's calling you in the middle of the night or whatever. I mean, still, as when I was a when I was a partner at both law firms, you, you know, you transition from your boss being the senior associate to the partner to the client who's actually writing the check, right? That helps to pay for your paycheck. And so I had a client that was in I Wyoming, and so being on Mountain Time. He'd be, and he was a surgeon or whatever, and he'd be like, okay, I'll call you, you know, 9 o'clock my time, which was 11 o'clock my time, his time, nine, nine, my time 11. And so I'd be on these conference calls sometimes to like 1 in the morning, you know, and I had friends that did deals with Japan or China, and, you know, you're sort of doing it in the middle of the night, you're waking up at 2 a.m., and you're doing these crazy calls and stuff like that. So when I saw that movie, I was like, I don't know what, I mean, I like the clothing and everything, and I thought that was fabulous, but I was like, I don't know why they're, why they're complaining about this. Um, so managing people, um, that, that's a big piece of it. Um, and uh, so, so my team currently is, we've got a few attorneys, got four attorneys, uh, we have a paralegal, executive assistants, I oversee also compliance, we have three people in our compliance department and risk management, um, which oversees all risks, clinical risks and all other types of risks, slips and falls and things like that. And she oversees the patient advocates, which are the people that go out to the hospital and um, when people are upset, whether it's an employee upset or uh, a mother or father of a child upset, or whoever, a visitor, um, those people go out and talk with them and try and de-escalate situations. Okay. Um, so in-house, uh, there's no shortage of work. Um, I don't know if you've talked to friends that are practicing lawyers. Um, they may talk about the ebb and flow of work, right? So sometimes you're so busy you can't see straight, right? And, and you're just sort of going to bed late and you're getting up in the morning and you're like, oh my gosh, when will this be over? And then there's these other times when you don't have anything to do. And let me tell you, even as a partner, you sort of go, oh my God. This may be the end. I may have nothing more to do the rest of my life, and this is going to be the end of my career, and da 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 da. And then, you know, you sort of don't appreciate it. Instead, as lawyers, we do this paranoia thing, right? And we, we revel in the paranoia of it all instead of just going, hey, this is a good time. I can go get my car washed, and I can do this. Instead, you sort of sit there, you know, sort of um, building up um, the acids in your stomach and everything else you possibly can do. So um, there is no shortage of work in in-house. Um, I sort of work, uh, talk about it as you're living with your client, right? So your client can tap you at any time and say, hey, what about this? Not only that, but remember, they're not paying for it. I mean, there's part of me that almost thought when I got there, I'm going to create these cost centers and then I'm going to go, hey, you used 50% of my budget last year and you used 20% of whatever and sort of try and do something like that so I could have them be a little bit more judicious when they're trying to give work to us, um, but I've yet to get there. Um, but what I've seen is that people will think the lawyer can do everything and answer everything. And they'll send us things and I'll go, well, that's not legal. You know, I mean, I can give you my business opinion on it, but you're the business person and it's your decision to make. I mean, if you want my input from a business standpoint, that's fine, but it's not legal. And so I'm not going to answer all your questions for you. You've got to sort of do your own work and take responsibility. Um, uh, becoming an expert. So for the associate general counsels in the group, and I know, you know, Cleveland Clinic and UH have huge legal departments, as well as every other major healthcare system in the country. Um, and so they segregate, you know, so people will do, you know, they'll be the regulatory people person that maybe does fraud and abuse and Stark and, and false claims and they've got other people that just do real estate and they've got other people that do um, maybe look at, at antitrust and they have other people that are doing liability and uh, malpractice liability and overseeing the outside counsel that typically does it but the in-house people sort of manage it. Um, and then, you know, there's the meetings. So in a hospital, like I'll have maybe six meetings a day. And at first when I got there, I was like, wow, this is really cool because I just get to go to meetings all day and I don't have to sit in my office and read documents. No, no, I go to the meetings and I have to read the documents and do the work. So um, it, it, is a, it is a bit crazy about meetings. And I've learned a lot about meetings that I wish 
I could go back and be, you know, an associate or partner in a law firm now that I know what it's like on the other side. Um, because um, it's interesting that, uh, and I remember an outside counsel at um, RPM, which is a big paint company, um, Dayglow and all that in Cleveland. And I remember the general counsel when he came to Kelpie, he spoke to us and he said, I'm not looking for an A plus dissertation type of memo. I'm not looking for a law review. And I ask you a question and I want you to do a memo. He goes, I want like a B plus. He goes, I don't want an A plus memo. So don't give me an A plus memo because I don't have time to read that. I'm not doing all that. Just give me a B plus kind of work. And what I do find with outside counsel when I call them up is, um, it's interesting, and I, I, I am guilty of doing the same to them, is they assume people in-house are not very smart, um, and they don't listen. They talk. And I remember when I went to Baker Donaldson, they did a big client development symposium where they took <coughs> only 20 people, it was very cool, and they shipped us all off for like three days to do client development. Um, and it goes for interviewing also, is people just want to talk, right? And so a good interview is probably the interviewer talking more than you. Um, because if they're talking, they probably are thinking they're having a great time. This is a fabulous conversation. They don't realize they spent 95% of the time talking. So if you can get them talking, you know, and, and in a way where they're having a good time talking, not like, oh my god, this interviewee will not speak, and so I must fill up this you know, space with, with, with dribble and drabble. So it, it's very important to remember, the most important thing about being a lawyer is, is being a good listener, um, and listening uh, to what the, the professor is saying right now, and what the professor wants, mm -hmm. and then in the interview, listening to the question, um, and not saying things like, well, to tell you the truth, <laughs> and doing stuff like that in interviews. Um, and then when you get the job is listening to what the assignment is and listening to what the expectation is and really being a good listener. And it takes a lot of hard work. Sometimes I will go into meetings because I like to talk a lot and I'll go, Anthea, shut up. Don't say anything in this meeting. I usually don't come out of there winning, right? Because I do say something, but I try to consciously go, just go in and listen. Listen to what they're talking about. Don't like anticipate what you think it's going to and what the answer is or try to solve their problem immediately. Just just listen to everything. All right. Where are we? Um, so what expertise for where are the future jobs in health law, right? I think that um, healthcare IT in the intersection specifically of healthcare IT and quality is going to be very key. Um, you know, the, the managed care payers for <coughs> 28 years have been saying they're going to pay for quality. Um, and there's been a lot of different programs that were uh, thought about by the federal government for literally, I think, the Athena project, and there were a bunch of different ones where they were going to pay for quality. Uh, we had the whole concept of managed care and, and Kaiser was going to sort of take over the country and everything was going to be very much a strict gate, gatekeeper closed model HMO and, and that never happened um, with capitation. But this time it may happen and so I think that quality is a metric that everyone is trying to gauge to determine who are the good providers versus the mediocre providers versus the providers who should not be doing this service ever again. Um, and healthcare IT is just where it's at, right? I mean, the EMR, um, I don't think anyone loves their EMR. You know, Epic is just, you know, I'll hear the providers just constantly talk about Epic. And today I opened Epic and there was a screen on top of the screen and I didn't know what to do with the second screen. And, and you know, trying to get information out of Epic and the intersection of privacy also with obviously, um, the trans transportation of information is a constant, you know, sort of raw here. Um, but at the end of the day, whoever has all the information is going to be king because they're going to know that for a child 14 that's an asthmatic, 
with this weight and this, this, and this, this is the best protocol to give that child um, for the best outcome. And so it's being able to corral that information and have that information. Um, so uh, show me the money. Um, I put that up there because that's the government's way of recouping money that it, uh, it believes that it inappropriately paid um, to providers. And I think you've seen statistics of, I think last year they recouped $3.8 billion, the federal government, from false claims, um, fraud and abuse, and um, Stark violations. Um, so that will continue to be. I mean, as long as Medicare continues to be what it is and Medicaid, there's always going to be um, the government, the FBI, the Department of Justice um, trying to um, hold everyone accountable to the rules. Um, I'm sort of a little bit tongue-in-cheek tongue about fraud and abuse because, you know, there's, there's two different kinds of situations. There's the outright fraud, right? Uh, these people, especially you see this a lot in Miami and in Florida for some reason, but they set up these companies, right? You'll, they set up a DME company or they sell up a, a, a PT or orthotic company. They bill $3.8 million to Medicaid in like a month and then they're gone and they're closed and they don't even know where the people are but they paid them. So there's that sort of all-out fraud. And then there's the stuff that I'll, I'll talk about that like my clients sort of did in the past, um, which is, you know, there's a nuanced situation in the Medicare regulations and it's a gray area and, you know, what, you know is, it, is it inappropriate or is, or is it not inappropriate? You know, for example, with Stark, um, it used to say that if you had a contract with, let's say, a hospital has a contract with an emergency department, so a service provider, and because of that independent contractor relationship, you had to have an agreement in writing. It had to have a term of at least one year. It had to have fair market value. It had to be signed by both parties. It had to be dated. It has like eight different metrics under Stark that that contract has to satisfy in order for the referrals from the ED physicians to the hospital for designated health services to be billed to Medicare to be able to be paid and appropriate. Well, it used to be that if your contract expired, but you kept providing the services and you kept paying and it's same terms, but you, you held over, so people refer to it as the holding over the contract, that was, a viol that was a violation of Stark. It was like, well, that's crazy. Like, who logically said that? That's sort of like I, I'm, I'm playing a game with like a, 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 my eight-year-old friend, and I'm eight years old, and he goes, oh, you stepped on that. Now the rule is you can't do that. You know, it was sort of a bit ridiculous. Well, Stark took about 15 years, but they finally, the federal government came out and said, oh, no, holding over is okay. We'll allow you to do that as long as it's the same terms and whatever. But mind you, there were a lot of people that paid back money. Uh, for those violations the prior 15 years. So anyway, show me the money. I mean, I think fraud and, and that whole area will continue to be. Um, specialization, um, you know, that's key for large law firms. Right now, I'm becoming a generalist. I'm, in some respects, I'm scared because I'm losing, losing the specialization I had at Stark and fraud and abuse. And I go, oh my God, I, because I'm not talking about it on a weekly basis, I, I'm fearful that I'm losing it. Um, and at in-house. I think in-house is huge. I mean, it used to be that most of the healthcare lawyers were in the law firms. And now a big percentage of them are inside. And with um, uh, biomedical companies, with the expansion of pharma, there's a lot of, uh, and, and IT, healthcare IT, there's a lot more healthcare jobs available than there used to be. So it sort of keeps expanding. So now is your time. There's water up there. I don't know if there's any extra sandwiches, but what what questions? Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or want to share anything? Yeah. Uh, going back to the remote work, how advisable or even practical is it to go into remote work coming out of law school, given that you don't have the same network like physically there? And are you talking about working remotely for like a law firm? Yeah. And how far away would the law firm be by driving? Like hours or a flight away, like, yeah. so you don't have that easy accessibility. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, I think you want to get the best job you can for that first job. It, it's very important to, um, to learn how to 
write and research as a lawyer. And I think in law school, um, and, and your probably teachings are much more advanced maybe than they were when I was in law school. And I think they maybe focus a little bit more, I know they do on business contracts, because I know someone was telling me they did, they had to do a contract for their um, 1L, their raw class, and I don't know if we ever did that. We did more of the focusing on litigation. So I think that if that's the best job, I think you take that maybe over the one. I will say this, is that um, I did get a little lonely. And uh, I remember a friend saying to me, well, why don't you just get up every day? And I have kids, right? Some of the kids would go off, my husband, you know, so, you know, I didn't have a dog, though, at the time. Now we have a dog. I think the dog might have helped everything. But I will say this, as crazy as it was, we had this, uh, we had this fish, right? This, and it was a beta fish, so you can't put another fish in there because it'll eat it. So I used to take the fish, literally, this is crazy, and I would move it to the desk and I would sit with the fish. <laughs> I don't know. So I think the dog might have helped her cat or something like that. Um, but I think that um, it, 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 a friend said, why don't you go to Starbucks every morning? And, you know, you could do some work from there. And I was just like, I don't have time for Starbucks, you know. And so I, I didn't do that um, because I was trying to be efficient, right? I wanted to do it. The other thing about working remotely that I didn't appreciate is that my job was always there. I didn't leave. And so every once in a while, I would hear my phone ringing like on a Saturday or Sunday or at night, you could hear it ringing from upstairs and I'd be like, oh, mm, do I go down? What do I do? So I think you really need to learn how to, to cut it off. But I think if you start off that way, you know, you can create some really good habits for yourself versus what I did, which was I was used to, you know, sort of being tethered and so that made it even more tethered. Um, I did go to Nashville or they had offices in New Orleans and and other places, Baton Rouge, and so I did go to other offices and hang out, but it was, I, I would recommend that if you do that, you go at the very beginning for like a week and say, hey, I need to stay in this office for a week and make some connections with people, face-to-face -face conversations, and then when you're there that week, go out to lunch, try and set up dinners with people so that you really have a lot of interaction, so that when you pick up that phone and you're talking with someone, they have a little bit of a face to put with a name, et cetera. So I think it's very, I think it's workable. There were, there were definitely pros to it. I didn't have to dress. I had no commute, no miles on the car, no gas. Um, so, it, and when I was done, I could literally shut it off, go upstairs and start cooking dinner. So it was nice from that standpoint also. Um, so um, I, think, I think also it's probably talking and making sure that like once a month, you can go to the main office for a couple of days and they'll pick up the expenses, et cetera, for all of that and, and, and have you, you know, sort of connected with people. Can you speak a little bit more as to like specialization throughout your career? Because I know a lot of firms now put you in a just a general practice area for your first one to three years. They they do. And so you know what's fascinating about health law, and I mentioned this when I was here two weeks ago, is don't do it unless you want to be a student for the rest of your life. Because unlike real estate law or corporate law that doesn't change very much, with health law, it's constantly changing. I mean, imagine when the Affordable Care Act came out. Imagine when HIPAA came out. Imagine when, you know, fraud and abuse came out and the Stark regulations. I mean, HIPAA in the Federal Register in 99 was like 1,000 pages. Now, what's great about that is you, as a second-year associate in a law firm, could read it all and become the expert in the firm. So it wasn't the partner. Because the partner often is um, fat and lazy, excuse me, right? And maybe doesn't want to do that work anymore, right? And so there's, and, there's, and let me tell you, that partner has sort of changed because now all partners, I think, in health law realize that they'll, they, they, they won't have anything to do. If they don't keep up with the law, and in health law, it's, it's a steep curve. It is a steep curve. It could change, change in a day, in a week, in a week. So I think... When, when you do get into a firm, right, so you start out, you're generalizing, and then you'll see opportunities. Something will come out, you know. For example, you know, maybe there's going to be a huge change with Medicare or, or Medicaid or something, and you go, I'm going to become the expert in my firm. And, you know, don't ask. Just start doing it, right? Just start reading and re researching or whatever. I did a lot of that. So what I did was um, I was in a firm that... 
there were some there were there were a bunch of health lawyers and one person left six months after I got there and another person went in house like a month after I got there and so I ended up in a situation where some of the people that would have been able to teach me had left and so um, I was left with unfortunately one senior partner who had been left behind he didn't keep up with stuff so he really didn't have a lot to teach and he was sort of more busy doing rainmaking and golfing and this and that, so he wasn't really there to help too much. And so I sort of taught myself. And I did it a lot by seminars. I went to a lot of American Health Lawyers Association seminars. They now have a lot of, I mean, you can get so much stuff on the web. I mean, that didn't exist. It sounds crazy. I sound like some old person. I am an old person. But, you know what I mean? But like, that didn't exist. I mean, literally, you could sit there and watch videos and listen to things and read so much on Stark. I mean, back then, I had to run to the library and look for paper parts that maybe came out. I mean, it was so, right? It was very crazy, the, the way you had to get information. Um, but now, you know, so, so find out what interests you. You know what I mean? Find out what interests you. And then also think about, you know, is, is it bioethics? Okay, bioethics in a law firm, not so much. It's fascinating. Bioethics in, in a hospital is good. I sent our bioethics committee and whatever, but it's not... It's not going to, you know, unless you get into a very specialized, like maybe St. Jude's Research Hospital has a bioethicist on staff. I think the Cleveland Clinic maybe has a bioethicist. I'm not sure if they're all lawyers or they're just bioethicists. But think about what interests you. And, and then also, I would align it, you know, with is there a need for it here? And even if there's not a need for it here, maybe you're getting yourself ready for your next job. Yeah? Sure. Mm -hmm. right. no. More questions? Um, are there any like major general differences between like in house like a hospital or a health network and like in house at like a pharmaceutical company or something of that nature? Yeah. So I think you know when you're in house at a hospital, there's two different kinds, right? It's either um, for profit, publicly traded. So being a securities attorney and knowing securities law is very important and all the K-1 statements and things like that that have to be for publicly traded companies and shareholders and shareholder disputes and shareholder litigation and this, that, and the other. In the world that I'm in with Cleveland Clinic and UH and, uh, well, Metro is a county hospital uh, but has its own set of rules, we're charitable entities. And so um, the IRS tax exemption 501c3, we sort of live and die by that with private enormous and private benefit. And, fair market value and making sure we're following the charitable mission of the organization in order to maintain the tax exemption. So I think that's the same thing that sort of happens when you get into a pharma company, right? In a pharma company, um, uh, it's a for-profit company. They have shareholders. They have obligations to the shareholders to um, uh, have a return on the investment. Um, while in a hospital, um, that's a tax-exempt hospital, money is a king the mission is came and taking care. So you sort of have to figure out like, you know, where would I like to be? What what do I want to do? So I, I think if you look at a lot of people that go into pharma and um, you'll see a lot of people that maybe come out of corporate securities. Um, healthcare isn't necessarily um, the main focus, but obviously they need all these people for fraud and abuse, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure they're not violating those rules, which, you know, there's been lots of investigations 15 years ago in the pharma companies with relationships with doctors and paying them phony consulting arrangements and directorships where they really weren't doing services. And, you know, so there's just tons of it, you know, in, in, in all the areas. Um, yeah, it it really was, and I wish I could go back and sort of grab someone and say, hey, tell me, like, what do I need to know? And it's funny because people would come into my office, my staff, and they would talk to me and they would say, oh, well, Robert said, and I'm like, Robert who? I, <laughs> I sort of felt like I was deposing people. So it, it, it is, and I think... Um, a lot of hospitals have similar things. So, um, you know, uh, we, we have this uh, OCR committee, and lots of hospitals have them, and it's, it's when 
you know, it, it's basically a convergence of HR and medical staff to determine when you have a medical staff member that's also an employee, how do you handle any kind of investigation or dispute concerning the physician. Um, you know, the, the ethics committee, um, uh, the peer review committees, the medical staff, medical staff bylaws. I mean, there's so many things that are um, exactly the same in all hospitals. They do the same thing. They all have the joint commission that comes in every two years, and then they've got all the different, you know, the, the regulatory department that oversees that, and then you've got you know, different departments, but it's, but it's very similar. And so I sort of feel like once you know it and you're in one hospital, you can easily transition to other hospitals. Um, but learning it is difficult. You know, I, I had represented hospitals in the past, obviously, a lot of hospitals. But when you're outside, um, and it changed over the years. So when I was first in practice, Hospitals, because they didn't have big medical staffs, would ask you to do like, would you help us with our medical staff bylaws, or would you help us with this little form or this little release? And then once they got staffs, they went out for the big stuff, the bet the farm, oh my God, like here we have this investigation, the FBI <coughs> is here, and we need you to oversee this, you know, sort of internal investigation of our billing for X, Y, and Z. So they weren't sending the little stuff out anymore. They were only sending sort of the big, like, you know. Make sure you've got a lot of malpractice insurance behind you because this is a really you know tough question and tough situation that you're going to be opining on. So um, it, it has changed through the years. I still think there's some more community hospitals that reach out to their um, outside law firms with easier issues, but um, there are a lot of um, uh, similarities between all the hospitals. They all have sort of the same Medicare conditions of participation. And the children's hospital is obviously different because Medicare is not a big payer at all. There's some for SSI eligibility, but uh, Medicaid is the big payer. And every state is different with regard to Medicaid. So it's not like you could sort of get together with all your different children's hospitals um, and say, hey, let's talk about Medicaid because everyone's got a different situation. I was just in Connecticut at a uh, chief legal officer meeting of um, children's hospitals, and there was 24 of us there. And you know, some people are talking about how their state doesn't have any Medicaid managed care, while Ohio is almost pr predominantly um, Medicaid managed care. So, well, thank you. I appreciate you all listening. I hope I didn't bore you too much. But if you have any questions, please feel free. You can always reach out to me at the hospital. Um, and you know we can we can chat about it. Good luck with your your school and the rest of the year. Thank you.